two stories have been absolutely dominating the news over the last few weeks. The first one is a speculative melt-up in the stock market, and the other one's all about pharmaceutical companies and their contracts with governments to provide vaccines. In this episode of The 12, we're going to look into a fiction book, two fiction books, actually, which will potentially change completely how you see those worlds, speculation in the stock market, and also the issue of pharmaceuticals and governments and vaccines. I say that on the condition that you have to be brave enough to buy the books because, Doug, Doug Casey, not many people agree with what's in them, do they? Well, they are out of the mainstream. I'm a, uh, philosophically, I'm what's known as a, a uh, anarcho-capitalist. In other words, I'm not, uh, I don't think that there's a, a good reason for government itself to exist. I'm not interested in getting good guys into government because if people want to go into government, they're probably not good guys to start with. And if they are good guys, they'll almost certainly be corrupted by the state. So these books uh, go off on that tangent. I could tell you what they're about. Yeah, I, I want to do some introduction of, uh, of you first um, and explain who you are. Um, you've been in the, the newsletter business for a long time yourself. And I once watched you give a speech in Vancouver in 2010, where um, I guess the content of your speech was about American foreign policy and about half of the audience actually left in outrage. And that inspired me to always tell people what I thought they should hear rather than what I thought they wanted to hear. Uh, so thanks for the, for the inspiration on that. Um, but it's worth uh, mentioning to the audience, because we're taking a risk by doing this, that uh, you probably won't agree with these, uh, these books and the messages in these books. Uh, but the good news is that the plot is a 10 out of 10 uh, on, for both of the books in my view. And so if you are interested in the, these issues, the speculation issue and what's going on with the vaccines, maybe you should take a look and, and keep an open mind about Doug's ideology and ideology that I definitely share. And uh, maybe he'll persuade you. Uh, maybe, Doug, you'll manage to convince people of anarcho-capitalism. Um, I've failed to do so ever, I think. Um, but like you say, let's, let's start with the plot of the first book, which is called Speculator. Hmm. I conveniently have a copy here to show. Uh, it happens to be the winner of the um, Leonard E. Reed Book Award for, um, what year was it? About four years ago, three years ago. In any event, uh, this book starts with our hero, Charles Knight, at age 23, although we investigate his younger years. And um, he's a self-taught uh, scholar, and uh, he's taught himself about geology and a little bit about mining and a little bit about everything. Gets involved in the um, mining stock market because he's interested in money. Tie up money with geology and you get mining. You get into mining, you get into mining stocks, which are the most volatile class of securities in the world. He uh, gets lucky, uh, puts a little bit of the money that he saved into one, and the stock goes, uh, goes ballistic on him. And he's got a million dollars on paper. Now this happens actually in the mining stock market. It's not terribly unusual during the gold bull market. So he decides to uh, go to uh, Africa, kind of jumping off the deep end, to investigate this company he's put his money into. And he gets involved in a, uh, a bush war with boy soldiers and uh, discovers that the stock is a fraud. Uh, and um, that's what happens. Uh, he makes, uh, one way or another, he makes a couple hundred million dollars, uh, has it stolen, uh, they say confiscated by the U.S. government, most of it, almost all of it, uh, and narrowly escapes um, criminal punishment. So uh, it's a pretty exciting story, uh, adventure story, but there's a lot of, in it about uh, the art of speculation and about mining and little penny stocks and things of that nature and the kind of people that inhabit uh, that uh, area of the markets. And this is all especially topical right now with uh, some speculative action playing out in the stock market. And what I find really interesting about that is that usually the speculator is, is considered a bad guy. 
that's one of the themes of, of this series of books that you've written, and they're called The High Ground, which I'm assuming means the moral high ground. But one of the people uh, of the professions, I suppose, that usually gets criticized heavily is the speculator. And part of the book is about how speculators are actually not so bad in some cases. But recently, the speculators become a bit of a hero, at least on social media, right? Well, I'd say that the speculator uh, should be considered as a moral hero, certainly can be. Uh, I draw the distinction here between um, uh, an investor and a speculator. An investor is one who puts money into a company in order to in order to finance productive activities, and if the company succeeds, the shares go up. Pretty simple. Uh, a speculator is a little bit different. Uh, he's one who's looking to take advantage of distortions in the market and misallocations of capital in the market. Uh, he doesn't get married to a company the way uh, an investor might. Uh, and a speculator is very different from a gambler, uh, which is what's going on in the markets today, incidentally. You've got millions and millions of people who are new to the markets, like the Robin Hood people, uh, that um, are, are throwing money at the market like it's a casino. Uh, that's, not, that's not speculating, incidentally. Uh, so uh, what uh, our hero Charles Knight does is he makes a successful speculation early on that this company was going to find a uh, gold deposit in West Africa, but it, and it appears that it did. And then he makes his big money when he finds that it's a fraud and he shorts the stock. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it, it's all about that type of thing. And, and, and this book is, <clears throat> all these books, they're called the High Ground Series because it amounts to a morality tale. I'm trying to show that the speculator, who most people think just um, sows havoc in the markets, actually serves a useful purpose. If we lived in a totally free market society, uh, speculators would be largely unemployed because there would be relatively few distortions in the market that they could capitalize on. Uh, same thing in, in Drug Lord, where we explore not only the uh, the uh, legal uh, drug industry, but the illegal drug industry, those regulated by the FDA, which I'd say should, should be renamed the Federal Death Authority uh, because it kills more people every year than the Department of Defense does in a typical decade, uh, and the DEA, which, uh, you know, things like heroin and cocaine and so forth. So Charles gets into both of those businesses and uh, gets into a lot of trouble. And then um, the interesting thing about these books is uh, Charles is very interested in doing the right thing, the ethical thing. And people, drug lords have a bad reputation in the market, but I don't see it that way. Uh, just, as, just as the people brewing gin and whiskey uh, during the prohibition in the U.S. from, what was that, from 1921 to 1933, something like that, had a bad reputation, but it was only because the, the state illegalized them. So uh, just as with alcohol, you've got to be prudent in your use of drugs, but there's nothing innately wrong with them. Uh, in any event, uh, Charles makes a fortune in speculator and gold mining, has it mostly stolen from them, makes a fortune in uh, the legal and illegal drug businesses. And we explain how these, both of them work, has it stolen from them, and they put him in jail. So now he's a little bit pissed off. And that leads us to the third novel, which, uh, which has just been released, Assassin, where he comes to the conclusion, uh, and assassins are looked on as bad guys. Incorrect, actually. Uh, well, sometimes incorrect. Because, in fact, in the world, some people just need killing. I mean, that's a radical thing to say. You're supposed to deplore violence, aren't you? Uh, anyway, the books, we're working now on, um, on, uh, we're working now on uh, terrorists, where after, after, after Charles's, uh, after Assassin, 
he ramps it up from point targets, which is what an assassin does, to area targets, which is what a terrorist does. And, and of course, a terrorist is automatically a bad guy, isn't he? I mean, that's, that's, that's the worst thing you can be in the world. But actually, like most, most things in the world today, it's misunderstood. Uh, a, uh, ter terrorism is really just a method of warfare. It's like cavalry charges or artillery barrages. Uh, it's a method of warfare. And uh, it's poorly used in today's world, stupidly used. And Charles, as an ethical guy, doesn't believe in uh, collateral damage. So he's accused of terrorism, but he never hurts anybody that doesn't deserve it. And we explain who might deserve it or not. Uh, and briefly, I'll tell you what the book after that's about, so you get an idea what's going on, where we're starting from with speculator and drug lord and assassin. After, uh, after uh, terrorism, uh, he's an, after terrorist, which we explain, uh, how that method of warfare works and how Charles uses it. Uh, he's hunted like Carlos the Jackal. So where do you go if you're a hunted terrorist? Well, the safest place to be is in a war zone. So he goes back to Africa, where the, where the series starts, to Gondwana, and becomes a warlord. And he takes a shithole country of Gondwana, and he transforms it into Singapore on steroids, Hong Kong even on steroids. And uh, that book is called Warlord, where we explain the noble occupation of a warlord. They have bad reputations too. So uh, anyway, should I go on with that or should we go back to talking about uh, speculator and drug lord and such? Um, no, so I think people are getting a, a good idea of just how controversial you are and uh... I think so it gets more controversial. I'm, I'm just warming up to the last three books, actually. <laughs> so, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the reasons Doug is so well known, because he doesn't pull any punches. And uh, he does have investment and financial advice based on all of this ideology. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning at this point a book and a, a speech on YouTube that I think you mentioned in the novel, which is called Defending the Undefendable by Walter Block. And I think part of what you're doing here is what Walter, who's an, an academic in the States, does. Uh, and he points out that the way we've been instructed to think about certain situations um, in terms of judging the morality of it, is it has become a little bit warped. And there's a whole bunch of situations in life where the, the uh, conventional judgment of people um, conventional wisdom, conventional morality, gets things quite badly wrong and violates people's rights. That tends to be, tends to be what his argument is. And um, you're setting up that argument with a, with a fictional story to prove the point. Um, it's very similar to Ayn Rand, who you also reference, where it's a demonstration that uh, a different way of looking at the world um, can be correct, at least. Uh, you and I would agree that it is correct. But people will, at least from reading these books and, and watching that speech from Walter Block or reading his book, will come to realize that we have at least got a point. And uh, as provocative as you are, there is a lot of sense and thought behind all of these ideas. One of the characters who gets a bad rep that you didn't mention, who's in the news right now, is the short seller. So can you take us through why a short seller uh, performs a very valuable service to financial markets? Yes, uh, a short seller uh, in many ways is a, is a Nietzschean hero. Uh, Nietzsche, as you know, said, that which is about to fall deserves to be pushed. And uh, from an economic point of view, the short seller is, is very helpful because uh, he's, uh, he, he's kind of weeding the garden by helping to destroy things which uh, would only absorb more capital and destroy it. So look at him from that point of view. But uh, even from the a practical financial market point of view. If somebody shorts, let's say a million shares of some stock, he has to buy them back later. And you only generally, a smart short seller only shorts companies which are uh, destroying capital, which are on their way down, which are failing. And when he shorts that stock at say $10, uh, he, 
he might want to cover it at one dollar which is exactly when the public will have decided gee i made a bad investment i better sell so when the public is selling he's there to buy at the bottom to cover his short so uh the short seller is actually a good guy from all points of view very helpful when he sells and very helpful when he buys back stocks so uh people don't understand this and the hedge funds that uh, were involved in shorting the stock game stock which is you know on its way to zero for a lot of reasons which we can discuss or, or not uh apparently the uh you know the mob of people that have no money and even less sophistication the trade on robin hood uh saw that there are there were a lot of shorts on this stock and they kind of cleverly it's clever for a mob to do it, it, it it's unusual for a mob to do anything clever but seeing all these shorts they just bought the stock and drove it up and drove it up so that the shorts were forced to cover and of course when a short is forced to cover that's more buying in the market so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, eventually the way this is going to work up work out is uh some big hedge funds have been bankrupted because of what the little guys have done and i'm no fan of hedge funds frankly i mean they're just they're just they're, they're you know they're, they're just fat cats uh you know they're, they're in the market they're playing a big boys game sometimes you win sometimes you lose but what's going to happen with this is that as gamestop and and these other stocks all go bankrupt these robin hood guys who are all long as the stock goes to zero a lot of them are going to get trapped so they may be temporarily rich right now but if they're long a stock that's headed for the trash can they're going to get wiped out eventually most of them anyway a brief rundown off the top of my head yeah so the the point that i think is worth drawing from that is that uh short sellers inherently are not bad the question is what they're really doing and why and uh, if you understand that, you can make the same points about the other people that you've mentioned, including terrorists and so on and so forth. And it's worth mentioning that terrorism is a government invented initiative, a government invented uh, way of going about war. Um, and, and assassinations can be a, a solution to, uh, to, that, to that problem. So the point well, is that, 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 that... That's right. Everybody says, well, if you saw Hitler when he was a kid, wouldn't you have assassinated him? And everybody says, yes. Well, that opens the door to, okay, well, who should be assassinated? So it's an interesting moral question. But I'm sorry I interrupted you, Nick, but I wanted to say that. No, that's, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. Um, let's move on to Drug Lord a bit more in, in a bit more detail because it's a softer version than uh, assassins and terrorists and, and warlords. And I, I think we've, uh, people have got to start at the beginning. Um, and there's there's drug lord so i'm about halfway through this book and uh it's right up my alley it reminds me of uh is it dallas buyers club the film yeah sure Where, yeah so the key point uh and i think this is really about smuggling uh, as much as as being a drug lord um in the book and in reality again it's a semi-fiction novel um the government restricts what medications people are allowed to get and the book starts off by you know, someone drinks a cup of coffee and, and points out, you know, it's a, it's a legal drug. And then it, you, you get to see you know, the softening up of the idea that why are some drugs illegal, some not. Um, there's illicit drugs like heroin, cocaine, and cannabis. Well, cannabis isn't illegal, illegal everywhere. But the book it also focuses on uh, medica medications, medicines uh, that are being restricted so that pharmaceutical companies can make bigger profits. And that is one of the, the the plots to the book. I wanted to mention all that to set up what I think we should discuss next, which is what you and I agree on. And that's, there's something inherently wrong with government action. When in, whenever governments get involved in anything, they seem to get it wrong. And I think that's what is the easiest way to sum up our ideology that we share. The idea that if the government is taking action, that it's, in, it's inherently flawed in some way. It's either going to backfire or cause a bigger problem or there's some dirty motivation behind it, some sort of corruption or combinations of those. 
do you think that's a good summary of, of what the books are about and what our shared ideology is about? <laughs> well, yes, because government, look, Mao Te Sung said, one of the world, lately, one of the world's leading experts on government, uh, the force of government comes out of the barrel of a gun. Uh, government is not based upon cooperation or camaraderie. It's based on force. You've got the guys that run the state and the people that are subject to it. So government itself is not only a bad thing, in my opinion, but it's an unnecessary thing. And uh, it evidences itself in the drug business, among others, because your primary possession as a human being is your own body. Uh, you should own and control your own body, first and foremost, and then the product of your own body, your car, your house, and the rest of it. But government inserts itself in this, and, and, and government is not we the people. I mean, that's a, that's a, a myth. That's, government is the guys that run it. And a certain type of person goes into government. There are people that are primarily, there are people that are interested in the material world and controlling themselves and the material world. And then there are people that are much more interested in controlling other people. And those people are drawn to the state, the way gamblers are drawn to Las Vegas and the way mafiosa can be drawn to New York City. So, uh, yeah, these, these books all talk about the state as being the enemy of the common decent person. It taxes him, takes 40%, 50% sometimes of his income, not just with income taxes, but import duties and VAT and sales taxes and the rest of it. It regulates him, tells him what he can do, where he can do, go and so forth. Uh, no, it's a it's it's a horrible and unnecessary institution. Sorry for that little soliloquy, but it was important to get that out. I think to say that people don't say that enough. Everybody says, "Well, we just need better people in government," and I talked about that when we started. We don't. You're not going to get them. That's what bothers me about what's been going on the last few years. If there's any time at which more people should become skeptical of government, it's you know, during a pandemic or it's during the Brexit you know, mess or you know, Trump and, and the Tea Party and all these things, all of those movements appealed to, to governments to change things that governments had caused the problem in the first place, as though <laughs> yes. you know, a different person or a different movement will fix things. But there's never any real uh, sort of rejection of the idea of using government, which is really just power, the power over others to try and fix those problems. Um, how do you think this is going to play out over the next few months with the vaccinations and lockdowns and all of this sort of issue? Because it seems to me that this topic of, of whether governments should have powers to control you know, what we eat, which medicines we take, when we can go outside, who we can see, how many, and so on and so forth, it's getting a bit far and people are getting fed up. Well, as well they, as well they should. They've been acting entirely too sheep-like so far. Speaking to COVID, I'm not an MD, I'm not a virologist, I'm not an epidemiologist, okay? That's fine. Uh, but I am somebody, I've always been a boy scientist, I've always read a lot of science, I read a lot of everything, quite frankly. And as best as I can determine, and of course the information that's come out in this virus hysteria because it's a hysteria more than anything else, most of it's unreliable and all over the place. You cannot trust anybody because this whole COVID-19 thing has been politicized. So it's no longer a question of science. In fact, one of the sad fallouts of this COVID-19 hysteria is it's going to delegitimize the very concept of science to a lot of people because science is being so misused. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, yes, this virus called COVID-19 can be deadly. Uh, the normal seasonal flu kills in between 30 and 60,000 people a year in the US alone. 
That's the normal seasonal flu. Now this virus uh, also kills people, but uh, the average age of death from the COVID-19 virus is about 78, and it's the same in the US as it is in Europe. Uh, and in Sweden, where they haven't had all these lockdowns, you don't have to wear masks and so forth, the number of people that have died with COVID is the same as in places that are strictly locked down. So that alone is proof that this is, that this is all hysteria. It's a great adventure for people in government to see how far they can push people that'll do what they're told. So now everybody's wearing a, a mask, which is about as effective against a virus as a chain link fences against mosquitoes. And they can't congregate. Uh, and it's being used as an excuse to deplatform people on the internet and so forth. I'm hoping, it's a hope against hope, that this COVID hysteria, which is mostly what it is, a lot of people die with COVID, but very few die of COVID, point I'd make. Uh, I'm hoping that um, it will get people looking into the concept of government itself as being a, a destroyer, not a helper. One of the themes in, I'm assuming all of the books, not just the two that, uh, or one and a half that I've read, and it's also a theme of your life, I know, has been that international travel and, and migration is one way to battle the government issue. Um, if you've got you know, healthcare issues in the United States, well, the system's a bit mad, so you're better off going to Thailand to, to get your healthcare there. Um, if, if you want to smoke marijuana, go to Holland. So your whole life has been a big part of, of proving that right. I think you're in Uruguay now. I know you've traveled a huge amount. Um, and I wonder if you can, it's a bit ironic given we're in lockdown and there's travel restrictions, but can you give people a, uh, an, I suppose, give them the inspiration to pursue that very international life and consider how that might improve their life and improve their ability to get out from under the foot of the government? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I've found that my countrymen are not people with whom I share government ID. In other words, just because somebody's born in the United States means nothing. My countrymen are people that I share values and ideas and interests with. And they're everywhere in the world, okay? So uh, that has uh, informed my being very international. I've, uh, I've traveled to uh, about 155 or 160 countries, uh, most, of the, most of those numerous times. I've lived in 10. And uh, so that's the way I do it. And it's, it's a better way of living, in my opinion, because uh, it exposes you to more opportunities and it makes it possible for you to get away from dangers. I mean, if I lived in Russia in 1917, I would have been happy to see the Tsar overthrown, but I would have wanted to get, out, get the hell out of there after what came next. And uh, this is true of so many countries. I'm afraid it's happening right now as we speak to the United States, which is really a pity because uh, that's about the last place in the world where there were some remnants of freedom. And this COVID nonsense is, has, has taken over the entire world, just about. Politicians love it as a means of control. It's, it's really very scary. That's also one of the themes in, in uh, the Drug Lord book is Charles Mike coming home and discovering a very different country to, uh, to the one that he left. Uh, and that's obviously an emotion that, that you that you share. Um, I have a bit of a theory that all of these libertarians and anarcho-capitalists, they, uh, they have a particular issue that they are not uh, anarcho-capitalists or libertarian about that they would ban. So for me, I hate annoying radio jingles. They drive me nuts. So I was wondering what you would ban by executive order if you were the president. What would I ban? Well, look. Uh, I can't think of anything offhand, simply because I believe that uh, I can't, listen, most people can't even remember what the Ten Commandments are, okay? That's too many. I mean, 
primitive people, when they count, they say two, three, many. It's hard to remember things past, past three. So forget about the Ten Commandments. Uh, I think there's only two laws talking about what you should ban. Uh, do all that you say you're going to do and don't aggress against other people or their property. That's pretty simple. Everybody can remember those two things. But then I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe two is too many. Uh, better keep it really simple. Uh, like physicists are trying to uh, put all the laws of physics into one great law. I believe I've done that from a moral point of view. And these, these books are morality plays as much as anything else. It's that the whole of the law is do what thou wilt, but be willing to accept the consequences. And people basically do whatever the hell they want to do anyway, basically. Uh, and if they understand, yeah, do whatever you want, but there will be consequences and you have to live with them. I think if that's kind of drummed into people as a child, it will hopefully make them think ahead a little bit and uh, lead to an education and ethics. The, the school system worldwide is totally screwed up. It's a disaster from every single point of view we could talk about. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's my view on, on, on that. Do what you want. Uh, but be prepared to accept the consequences. And, and if you do that, you'll, you'll inevitably wind up doing, almost inevitably, I think, the ethical thing. I think it's worth pointing out that what the government does is precisely the opposite to the two things you mentioned. They change the law, which means they, they you know, change what people say they're going to do. And they have the right of aggression against others. Um, and that's part of the morality of it. Um, and people seem to believe that that's a necessary evil. Um, but I suppose our point is, is that it's not. Yeah, you know, is anything that, is any evil really necessary? And is anything that's necessary really evil? So this is, this. listen, this may be part of the general corruption of the language. So I don't believe in necessary evils, quite frankly. I, I don't think I do most of the time. So one of the particular topics which i think is going to play out in in the second half of of drug lord is the issue of of i suppose um privatization so when so-called libertarians and free market thinkers what they tend to have as a solution is you know we'll we'll try to privatize the issue or bring the free market into this a little bit but in the american healthcare system especially on drug regulation that's been a bit of a disaster. Um, the way the insurance works, the way the FDA works hand in glove with the pharmaceutical companies. Introducing the free market system has made an even bigger mess, um, arguably than um, libertarians would say the NHS in, in Britain is, where the government controls just about everything. Um, and I wanna get your take on this idea that it's not as simple as privatization. No, it's not. Uh privatization gives a bad name to the free market and capitalism because after something's privatized, it's still under the thumb of the state where they have to do all kinds of stupid and uneconomic and unproductive and destructive things. So uh, look, you can't have a, a partnership between uh, the mafia. It's like a partnership between a mafia lord and a shop owner. What kind of a partnership is that, okay? And the relationship between the average citizen and the government is similar to that. So uh, the solution is not to trim things around the edges. The state and government is like a cancer. And if you trim it back, it'll, it'll grow back even stronger. You've got to root it out by the, uh, you got to root it out by the roots and pour Agent Orange where it grew. So, uh, no, the, the, the answer is to get the government out of people's lives. Why? Because coercion does not belong in a civilized society. Uh, so the less government, the more civilized and the more responsible people tend to be. That's what I find. Yeah, you have criminal elements, but how do you handle criminal elements? Uh, well, 
Charles Knight goes into that a lot in Assassin, actually. So one of the challenges that I see for, for libertarians and narco-capitalists is this issue of social media companies and the power that they're wielding, um, the ability to deplatform people. But social media companies are private companies and they should have the right to deplatform people just as a shop owner should have the right to ban someone from their, their uh, shop, right? Uh, yes, I agree. That's perfectly true. But the situation is complicated by the fact that we don't live in a free market world. We don't live in a capitalist world. We live in actually a fascist world. And let me define, let me define that, okay? It's not the definition that the so-called Antifa people use. Fascism is a system where the state and business are melded together. The term was developed by Benito Mussolini. And it comes from the fasces, which is the old Roman, an ax with some fasces bound around it to give it strength. The ax is the state, deadly power, and the fasces are the corporations. That's what fascism was. It was a melding of the state with business, of, of corporations with government, of power with money. Uh, and that's what we have today. So getting back to uh, getting back to what Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of them are doing, uh, these things are actually acting as arms of the state at this point, even going so far as to uh, destroy Parler, which was competition to them. So um, nothing wrong with corporations in themselves, but wherever the state uh, fits itself in to use power, uh, it corrupts everything it touches, including the corporations. So uh, look, the whole situation is such a mess today uh, because of that. The state's getting out of control. <laughs> it's a big problem. But uh, of course, as the greater depression, which we've now entered upon, gets worse, it's gonna wash away most of the current landscape we have. Uh, in a way, that's a good thing, but it's going to be scary and it's going to be inconvenient. It's going to be unpleasant and we might get something even worse afterwards. So um, I don't know if that's a direct answer to the question or not, Nick. Well, it leads to my next question, which is you know, our, uh, our mutual enemy that we disagree with, regardless of what it's up to, is the government. But the government seem to be struggling for financing of late. They've taken over economies to an extent where they're struggling to to pay for it in terms of borrowing, and they've turned to their friends, the central bankers. But historically speaking, when they do that, it all goes badly wrong for the size of government that we're at now. So you're worried about what comes next, but uh, I suppose it, it could go well for libertarians too, right? Uh, I don't think so, I'm sad to say. Uh, you know, look, since day one for mankind, maybe 200,000 years ago, Things have gotten better and better. Actually, uh, actually, on a hyperbolic curve, uh, you know, we grubbed for roots and berries in the dirt for 100,000 years and then conquered fire and then 50,000 years later, learned to nap flint. And, you know, now technology is accelerating on a, almost a vertical curve headed towards Ray Kurzweil's singularity, frankly. Uh, okay, hey, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that if you take that Meyer Briggs personality test, very common test, uh, if people aren't familiar with it, they can Google it, Meyer Briggs. Uh, you find that people that have libertarian characteristics are probably only about simply two to 4% of the population. So I'm afraid, Nick, that you and I are genetic mutants almost, libertarians are and probably always will be in a minority. Uh, people are tribal. They like to control other people. That's how they feel safe. They like somebody to lead them. They're like sheep. So frankly, although these books I wrote are optimistic as we move towards the last one, Apocalypse, uh, although it's hard to 
I know that it's going to shock people. How can a book with a name called Apocalypse possibly be optimistic? But um, yeah, we're we're headed for we're headed for very very tough times through uh, this decade. It's it's going to be rather ugly, I'm afraid. And libertarian uh, libertarians are not going to be held in high regard in the market. I don't think because, least because people, we're black sheep. Yeah, I agree. Uh, at least people have your books for comfort. Um, we'll finish on that very optimistic note. Uh, Doug Casey, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for sharing uh, the plots of your books. Well, thank you, Nick, and uh, I'm happy to come back and chat <laughs> anytime. It's a pleasure. We'll, uh, we'll do another review once you've published uh, Apocalypse, I think, if, if we're still around to do so. Um, do <laughs> tune in next week as well, everyone. We won't be doing anything uh, next month, I should say. We won't be doing anything as, as controversial as Doug's books. We'll be doing something that uh, is all about technology in the future and, and mining, funnily enough, so it is relevant to you, Doug. Um, I've just secured uh, the interview and I'm really excited and it's going to be excellent. So don't let Doug put you off if you completely disagree with everything that we've said. Thanks for watching.